So in the previous video, I left you hanging with the mystery van having made an appearance. And I said that there's no way to just set the CS, the code segment register. You can't do a move instruction and you can't just do a pop instruction. And so how can you practically speaking transition from ring three to ring zero? Well, call gates are one of the ways that you can do that. So basically, you can think of a call gate like Sonic's running along at his normal privilege level, CPL3. He hits a call gate, and boing, he's up to CPL0. But it's obviously more complicated than that, so how does it work? Well, we've got a call gate descriptor, and this is one of the 16-byte system segment descriptor types of things that fit into the GDT or LDT. But the interesting thing about the call gate descriptor is that it has a segment selector inside of it and a segment offset that allows for a 64-bit value. So unlike some of the segment descriptors that we've seen, such as the ones for code and data that have some sort of segment base and segment limit, this instead seems to have something akin to a logical address or a far pointer. There's a segment selector and a offset into that segment. Well, this is one more down of the system segment descriptors that we've, we want to cover all of these as we go. So how does one call a call gate? Well, you issue a call instruction with a far pointer that has a segment selector that points at a call gate segment descriptor. All right, it's all so clear. It's not as if I, you know, have just thrown out a ton of jargon at you. So let's see some different ways we can visualize that. Intel has this picture, which says you have a call of a far pointer to a call gate, and this far pointer is a segment selector and an offset, but this offset is not actually used by the processor. So I call this a faux far pointer. It is a fake far pointer. So you have to put an offset, but it's not actually going to be used. Instead, the call instruction is mostly just using this segment selector behind the scenes. It is selecting a segment descriptor in the descriptor table, could be the GDT, could be the LDT, selects this call gate descriptor. The call gate descriptor is itself basically a far pointer because it has a segment selector and an offset. So this far pointer is then further selecting a different thing from within the GDT or LDT. So this would point at a code segment descriptor, and this would have you know, a base and a limit, but in 64-bit world, we don't care about either of those. And so you would basically take this far pointer and you would use the base from whatever it selects, and you'd use the offset that's baked into the GDT, and you wouldn't care about the offset that the person in ring three happened to use. And you just add the offset to the base, and that's how you would find the actual address where the code to be run is found. So let's look at that again in my customized uh, animate style diagrams. So we've got our faux far pointer. So we've got a segment selector and an offset that doesn't really matter, so it can be anything. We'll just set it to zeros. Segment selector, required but not used. Great. So what does this segment selector actually encode? Well, eight is one zero zero zero. So it's saying, you know, I request the privilege level of zero. I have a table indicator of zero. So I want to select from the GDT. And then let's just say that it happens to say index one because that's what this uses here. So index one in this call would be expected to point at a call gate segment descriptor. So that was this 16-byte data structure that we saw just a second ago, and which has a basically a far pointer inside of it, a segment selector, and a 64-bit offset. So that would have some values in there. Let's just make up some values. Let's say that the segment selector itself had a uh, RPL of zero, a table indicator of zero, and a index of three. So this is going to grab the third entry from the GDT. And we'll just say the 64-bit address is FFF 1234000. It's got a descriptor privilege level in the call gate of three. This indicates that co ring three code can call through here. If this was zero, then you couldn't call through this call gate. And it's got a present bit of one just to indicate it's actually here. All right, well, that's the call gate segment descriptor, which for all intents and purposes is just its own far pointer. And that selects index three out of the GDT. 
which would be some sort of call, uh, call some sort of code segment. But in 64-bit, the code segment base and limit aren't really cared about, so it's just going to be treated as zero. And it's going to say that base of zero plus this offset from the call gate of FFFF1234000 would mean that ultimately it's just going to be FFFF1234000. So the new code segment register is going to be the value that was plucked from the call gate. So this is how we actually change the code segment register by calling through a call gate and we'll learn some more ways in the future. So the net result of all that is that you called a call gate and you landed in some kernel address. So what does that look like? Exactly like this. CPL3 running along, calls a call gate and boom, up to some code running in kernel space at some particular address that the kernel set up by filling in a call gate into the, into the GDT or LDT. So that got you into kernel space. How do you get back? Well, if a normal call instruction pushes an RIP, then a far call through a interprivilege call gate is going to push the SSRSP and the CSRIP. And so between these two things, that gives you enough information to resume back to where you were coming from, and you do that via the return instruction. So just like there's a special form of the call instruction that knows about this sort of far call through a interprivilege call gate segment descriptor, there is a far return that knows to pop this stuff off of the stack, pop an RIP, an old CS, an old RSP, an old SS, to get you back down to ring three, because this CS would be pointing at your ring three code segment. This would be pointing at your ring three stack segment, and it'll get you back down to ring three. So all of that said, this was just a example of one way that you could get from ring three to ring zero, but nobody actually uses this anymore. Used it a really, really long time ago, like Windows 95 type long ago, but this is not what they use. I just wanted to cover it so that we could, you know, see, you know, one of the mechanisms that exists so we can cover all of our segment descriptor types. But also, you know, I referenced a while back this Alex Ionescu blog post about uh, how the LDT was used on Windows. In that post, he actually talks about how he used call gates in order to build a sort of attack against uh, Windows kernel, but it was one that was already closed at the time. But to me, this is a very good example of how people who really understand the system at a deep level can come up with these kind of attacks and they can find the corner cases that other people miss. And so it's again, you know, part of the uh, satisfaction that comes from really understanding the system at a deep level. So now that you understand call gates and you understand segments and things like that, you will be extremely well prepared to go read and understand this post. So what's new? What else did we learn in this section? Well, we saw the call gate segment selector can be used to point at some call gate in the LDT or GDT. Here it just happens to be shown in the LDT. And that call gate ultimately points at some sort of protected procedure, some sort of code in the kernel that is intended to run and do some action after transitioning from user space to kernel space.